Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We are waking up this weekend with watches, and everything you see here is for sale. Reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Names, references, and when available, prices in the description below. But we are also buying and stocking up for the holiday season. Sell me a watch. Sell me a full collection. No upper limit on value paid or highest prices of the year. Reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com to sell a watch. Let's go big. A big piece from a big brand, a real heavy hitter. This is the Alonga Unzona Richard Longa Tourbillon Tour Le Marite. 41.9 millimeters. It's not as big as it looks. It's big in a figurative sense. A timepiece that includes a regulator dial, a tourbillon with stop seconds, an extraordinary disappearing panel. Like the rest of the dial, in sterling silver, galvanized this silver white color. And there's more because you turn it over and you get a fusee and chain. You can see the timepiece extraordinary with caliber L072. Manual wind, fusee and chain, constant force device. And as you wind it, you can see that the chain is transferred from the barrel to the fusee. There's a planetary system that keeps the force constant to the escapement as you wind the system. And it works like bicycle gearing, whereby as the mainspring discharges and has less force to turn, it pulls a larger diameter of the fusee. It's an old pocket watch style constant force device. And you can see the timepiece extraordinarily detailed. The fusee and chain is just one part of its appeal. Look how much black polish there is on this reverse side. Look at the engine turning in two different sizes. Look at the mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge lighting up. Look at the blued screws fired in a kiln, the freehand engraving of the underside structure of the tourbillon, and the diamond capstone used on the underside of the tourbillon. Take a look at the skeletonization of the bridges, opening up the movement in a way very few longer three-quarter bridge case backs are. Jewels set in chiton, pivot jewels, that is, pocket watch style, and then that nickel copper zinc alloy we call German silver with the copper giving it that golden hue. The timepiece features an extraordinary tourbillon carriage, and I'm going to get as close as I can. You can see it too is black polished as well as beveled. It's free sprung with an overcoil hairspring, and it is one of the few tourbillon regulators that has a stop seconds function for precise setting. There's a triple overlapping Johann Seyfert scale, that's what that's called, it's not a Venn diagram, and on the wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference, the watch wears really nicely. It's large for a Langa, but it's not large, and under 42 millimeters you might be surprised at how compact it wears on even a smaller wrist. 40, I would say 14 centimeters circumference, and up you can wear this watch. It also features a rare for longa full deployment clasp, something that is scarcely seen even on the brand's flagship complications. Now jumping to a watch that represents, for a lot of folks, something approaching the ultimate current production Rolex. This is the 126719, and it is the BLRO, the Pepsi Meteorite. As launched in 2019, this watch, as you can see, features the little Rolex crown between Swiss and made. It's the three-day power reserve. It's white gold, but it's white gold with the Oyster bracelet, an important distinction now that the Jubilee bracelet steel watch exists. If you want white metal, you want the Pepsi, and you want an Oyster bracelet, which is the somewhat more substantial, more sporting, more aggressive and traditional look. You have to go white gold. And if you're going white gold, go with the meteorite. You have this oxidized iron taken from meteorite and these Widman statin patterns create a permanent crystalline, almost iridescent and somewhat three-dimensional appearance. The white gold indices seem to be floating on the dial. No two of these are going to be exactly alike, so it's the best of both worlds. Rolex precision and heritage, but with individuality. You have the bi-directional rotating white gold bezel. It has a ceramic insert in two colors, blue and red, like the Pan Am-inspired original watch of 1954. It's still a pilot-style watch and can be temporarily used to calculate three different time zones. It's 100 meters water resistant too, so though it's a pilot's watch, make no mistake, it is very swimmable and well loomed. You have the ability to change the local hand as well as jump the date in both directions, and the watch will continue to tick and keep time. There's that second time zone, which is in a 24-hour format, and once you hack the watch, you can move everything in sync and set it to the second. The timepiece wears well, though 40 millimeters, it looks a little bit larger on the wrist, and I describe it as more of a 42 millimeter case size, in spite of the nominal measurement. Throwing it on my wrist, once again, you know how my 
wrist is at this point, oval and cross section, flat on the top, 16 centimeters circumference. It wears really nicely. And perhaps the biggest surprise is, as hefty as it is, and it really is in white gold, it's not a thick watch, and it will slide easily under a cuff. This is a great all-arounder if you want a sports watch that could also wear as a dress watch. But if you want to go even a little bit more formal or a bit more glam, then a Rolex Submariner in yellow gold is about as extravagant as it gets. This could absolutely be a dress watch. And Rolex is one of the few brands that can manage to build a full yellow gold, full bracelet sports watch without seeming garish, nouveau riche, or arriviste. The timepiece looks refined, sophisticated, even somewhat sober with the combination of the black and the yellow. Cornish colors, of course, or Pittsburgh Steelers, but very traditional as Rolex has never abandoned yellow gold. Along with Alango Unzona and Patek Philippe, they're probably the foremost manufacturers of popular yellow gold timepieces in the modern era. And the sub in full yellow gold really looks the part of a flagship watch, a statement watch. And while the president may formally be Rolex's traditional power watch, a full gold, full bracelet Submariner is definitely in the running. When the stakes are high, this is about as high flying as it comes. This is a watch with enormous presence without enormous sizes. Like the GMT, it's not really a 40 millimeter watch. The timepiece is 300 meters water resistant and a feature I love here is the glide lock system. So you have the ability to make these two millimeter incremental adjustments up to 20 millimeters. So there's a lot of flexible sizing in there. Now you can use that of course over a dive suit, but it's probably gonna be used more often than not to simply adjust the size with your activity or inactivity, hot or cold weather. The clasp is a double locker, and of course, the case is fairly slim. We're just talking about 12.7, 12.8 millimeters, trip lock crown, screw down, one of the best bezel detents you'll ever encounter. Have a listen to this. And of course, the bezel insert is ceramic. Let's do some loom shots now. We've had a couple of sports watches. Let's roll them through the light. Okay, here's the sub in Rolex Chromalite Blue. Fans will know that Rolex makes its own lumen. It's this distinctive cyan blue by night. I've got a couple that you might love, but probably won't guess. Do you have any idea what this is gonna be? Or for that matter, how this might appear by day? Let's turn the lights on and find out. And the answer is the mid-2000s Blancpain Le Mans Flyback Atout Vitesse. The Atout Vitesse models were three special editions, all of them extremely rare, created for a Chicago area retailer of Blancpain. So around 2004-2005, three versions, the Revive GMT, the Flyback Chronograph, and I think the other one was a Perpetual Calendar Chrono were all created, and this model, built in 20 pieces in stainless steel, is probably the crowd pleaser, as the 38 millimeter stainless steel flyback chrono is an awesome piece, universally wearable, formal enough to be a dress watch with a screw down crown, plenty of loom, automatic winding, and 100 meters water resistant. This is a real sports watch. And when you throw it on the wrist, you can see it has presence without bulk. It's very short across the wrist from side to side, and you can see from overhead that this is gonna wear well on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference. The watch has a lot of punch, and I'm happy to say that what at first glance appears to be Fotina is not, as it's more distinctly orange in tone than the usually brown or ecru Fotina. It's just a cool color combination. The dial is black, the accents are red, and then orange is dominant on the indices as well as the hands. If you look closely, you can see that one of the best details here is that that the underlying numerals are actually white, so there's a little white border on the base of each orange Arabic numeral. You can also see there are little orange on white indices outboard and those red accents every five minutes. Roll the watch over, you can see it has a fascinating double-stepped bezel that is germane to these Le Mans models. And then on the reverse side, individual numbering. This is number one of the 20. Again, three different models. This one was built in 20 pieces, and you can see the caliber F-185 on the reverse side, it's based on the Frédéric Piguet 1185, but this is the flyback model, gorgeous in its hand finishing. You can see the mirrored beveling on the edge of the rotor, as well as the edges of the bridges. There's engine turning on the bridges themselves, as well as the base plate, a little bit of Cote de Genève, and the watch in fascinating form features both alongside black polished screws, a column wheel, and the watch does include a vertical clutch, so all of the modern standards are present and correct. This is a really cool watch that comes with a matching stainless steel 
handle, full deployment clasp. The size is perfect, the colors are gorgeous, the production is small, and technically speaking, aesthetically speaking, the watch delivers dial and case back both. But let's say you want to combine that full gold, full bracelet sub with the watch you see here. Let's up the ante. I mentioned that there was a perpetual calendar version of that watch. This is it, 25 pieces, rose gold. This is not from the Atufi test line, but you will be able to see that the timepiece is the same 38 millimeter Le Mans case, has the same 100 meter water resistance, has the same basic chronograph base caliber, but we are taking it to the next level, 25 pieces in red gold, not rose, not pink, red gold, on the legendary Blancpain X71 interlock bracelet. Now rolling around here, you can see that this watch remains just as wearable, but the level of luxury is stepped up, not by degrees, but by an order of magnitude. The dial base is a lovely navy blue. It features yellow on white indices and a few well-chosen red accents. Now it is a perpetual calendar chronograph. You know this is a genre made famous by Patek Philippe, but you will not find too many automatic winding Patek Philippe perpetual calendar chronos. You can also see here that the quality of the finishing is excellent. And this caliber F585, as with the Atufi test, column wheel, vertical clutch, but with a perpetual calendar system, so you need not adjust until the year 2100. It can deal with leap years, it can deal with irregular length months, and as you can see, this watch on the full bracelet is incredibly grand. But again, it's not overblown, it's not trying too hard. The size is chaste, the details are beautiful. You get the most out of this watch when you get close to it. It's not something designed to be noticed across the room. Only the connoisseur with a sharp eye will note this traditionally sized watch from a connoisseur brand. It is fantastic, and again, being loomed, automatic, and fully water resistant to the point that you can swim with it. This is a real all-around high horology sports watch option. One more feature to show you, because I forgot to mention it. It is also a flyback chronograph. Blancpain, I love you. Okay, let's talk about a value option. This is relatively new, just launched in the last year. This is the Bremont Broadsword, part of a series of watches in the new Armed Forces collection that feature the insignia used by permission from the Ministry of Defense. So Her Majesty's Armed Forces, and you will actually see it says right under the Bremont logo at 12 o'clock, Her Majesty's Armed Forces, abbreviated. The idea here is to recall the 1940s dirty dozen military watches built by, well, 12 different manufacturers for the Ministry of Defense. And to that end, we have a very faithful dial, with the exception of the convenient and rather in my opinion, useful date window. Now the watch is final assembled in the London area, and you can see that for once, Bremont is breaking from its triptych case design. Rather than having a module that holds the dial and the movement, we now have a seamless case that's perhaps a little bit more wearable as a result, being just over 47 millimeters lug to lug, under 13 millimeters thick and 40 millimeters in diameter. The movement is a modified Salida SW200 in chronometer grade, and it's 100 meters water resistant, so you're getting an awful lot with this watch. I really enjoy wearing it because it's short across the wrist, comfortable on the wrist, reasonable in size, possibly a unisex option if you want a field style watch but you don't have a big wrist. This is a great way to get into it. And again, with a chronometer grade movement, 100 meters of water resistance, plenty of loom, automatic winding. This is a timepiece that is super versatile. It's also low enough to fit under a cuff, so if you want one watch to do it all, this is a great way to do it with a watch that is assembled in England. Let's do a quick loom shot here. You can see plenty of loom right down to the small seconds, double index up at 12, and you can see there's actually a triple loom for each numeral. You've got the numeral, you have an index outboard, and then you have a circular cabochon of loom outermost. Leading in here with the loom shot, I wonder if you guys can guess this one. I'm Gonna go out of my way and say you know the brand, but you don't know the model. Are you ready? Here it comes. This is the Zin UX. Do you want a 5,000 meter water resistant sports watch? Boom, here it is. A timepiece 44 millimeters in U-boat steel. It's between 
400 and 450 vickers in hardness, and it is so anti-corrosion that it can effectively encounter chemicals and salt with no need for rinsing. So anti-corrosive that it's comparable to Rolex's oyster steel, as Rolex is now calling it. But here's the important thing. It is harder than Rolex Oyster Steel, and that's key. It is more scratch resistant, and that's before we even get to the bezel, which is 1,200 Vickers and several microns thick. It is a tegmented carbon diffused bezel that's, as you can see, held on by screws with captive construction, meaning you can't accidentally snap it off. So you have a nearly indestructible bezel on a corrosion resistant case that's super hard, made of German U boat steel from the Ballmann Voss shipyards. The timepiece features Zinn's own bracelet, which is, by the way, adjusted using hex screw fixed removable links. And then when you pop it open, internally there is a fold out dive extension that is very solid, thicker and more substantial than it has to be, with a couple of different divots to anchor it, so you have the ability to fine tune the size. You also appreciate the fact that this watch is not thick, being quartz powered. It is only 13.5 millimeters thick, but we are pussyfooting around the single biggest selling point of this watch. I regret the marks on the crystal. I need to wipe this down and I can't find my polishing cloth, but all the same, the interior of the watch is full of oil. A pioneering concept from the 1990s, first launched on the EZM2, later in 2006 on a civilian market UX, the Hydro, and you can see the logo on the dial, system for Zinn, means that at any angle, because the oil and the sapphire have the same index of refraction, there is no distortion. Even at the flattest possible angle, you can still read the time, discern the indices and the hands. This has been built out by Zinn for its own watches, as well as for a few watches made for Bell & Ross during the 1990s. Other advantages of the system, the fact that with oil inside, and even the movement and the hands are bathed in oil, the whole thing is incompressible, able to resist from the inside the pressure of the outside. That's how it's 5,000 meters water resistant. Moreover, there is no problem with fogging. Fogging is stopped dead by this system, so there's a lot to love. The crown is off-centered, so it won't dig your hand, whether you're a lefty or a righty. And the movement on the inside is actually an ETA thermal line based on the 955 series, meaning it has an extraordinary 180-month power reserve and it's accurate to within about 10 seconds a year, courtesy of a thermocompensated quartz circuit. So there's a lot to see, to love, and to learn about this watch, which is anything but a standard quartz sports watch. 5,000 meters water resistant. You could drop this thing, and it could practically land on the deck of the Titanic and still operate. You won't, but it will. Now we're going upscale a little bit. Two different sports watches from FP Journal. Let's start with the older of the two. Fully loomed, 42 millimeters, titanium, and discontinued. This is the Line Sports Santograph Sport, taking the same basic mechanism that won the GPHG Eguido as the Santograph Souverain, and that is the grand prize at the Oscars of watchmaking. That was just about four years prior to the start of the Line Sport Collection, which in 2011 became F.P. Journe's integrated bracelet sports watch series. The Santograph, mechanically identical to its predecessor, gained a integrated lug and bracelet profile. You can see the rubber bumpers have done their job over the years, preventing any disfigurement of the metal itself. This is held up well, and in the end, I have to say I'm a fan of the rubber bumpers. The integration of the bracelet and the lugs means this is not the case from the Santograph Souverain. This is a sports case with a different look and a different feel. The dial is a, I would call it nickel anthracite with applique numerals, and you can see them. They're actually three-dimensional. They're blocks of loom rather than printed features. You can see that there are smoked sapphires for the 1 100th of a second, that is a one second circuit, the 20 second dial, and the 10 minute dial. Unlike the standard Santograph Souverain, the tachymeters are removed from each and the centers are opened up. So you can see, for example, the second escapement operating at 100 beats a second that underpins the Foudrillon or Santograph system that gives the watch its name. Now it has an 80 hour power reserve with the chronograph off, 24 hour power reserve with the chronograph on, and it's the subject of two patents, one of which is for this rocker system, which looks like a mono pusher, but allows you to actually stop and then restart en route, and you can also reset. It's a wonderful piece of theater to do so. And then the second patent is for the drive system of the chronograph. The barrel, you'll note, is at the center of the movement, 
and the movement is entirely in aluminum, so this is a very light watch. But the barrel, via its arbor, essentially the axle at its center, drives the chronograph, and then its toothed edge, which you can see, drives the time. So that is the second basis for this watch's second patent the pusher system and the drive system. Now you also note that the movement's properly sized for the case, which is refreshing, and it has a very different look than the rose gold standard model. You'll also note that it's a free sprung architecture, so it's fairly shock tolerant, and the watch is very light. Wearing easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it is feathery, but it's also fairly thin. So if you wanted to wear this watch as your only watch or your dress watch, you'd certainly be within the realm of reason. This is a timepiece that I could see on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, and we're gonna do a loom shot, because I promise I promised you that this watch is well loomed. There you go right there. Loom on the Santograph Sport 42. And now we jump to the Chronograph Monopoussoir. This was the last of the three versions of this watch to launch and actually came out rather than late 2017, fairly early in 2018. And the timepiece is 44 millimeters, but only 12.2 millimeters thick. So this platinum model with blue mauve dial is broad but flat, and it's the combination of the chiseled platinum case with the color of the blue mauve dial that really makes this the best version of the Mono Pusher Sport. You'll also appreciate that the dial features a couple of nuances that are easy to overlook at first glance. You can see that the numerals themselves are applique and precious metal. There's a wonderful frosting atop the hands as well as the bezel that features the chronograph minutes and the constant seconds. So you have a three-dimensional dial of a high grade. You can also see there's a double-digit date down at six o'clock, and that represents the return of the date on Jorn chronographs for the first time since the Octa Chrono. The insert of the bezel is actually ceramic for scratch resistance, and you can see this is one of the original models with the rubber bumpers that do a pretty good job of protecting that hand-chiseled surface. The finishing here is exquisite. Jorn watches are less about interior finish and more about exterior finish, and you can really see that in the bevel that runs all the way around the case. You'll also note that the chiseling here, which is manually accomplished, is gorgeous giving it a wonderfully soft and subtle glow rather than the flash and the shine of polished metal. The timepiece, of course, features a movement of Jorn's own design, and if you remember the 2017 Only Watts Mono Pusher, you can sort of see where it comes from. A big technical difference between this movement and the others is that it features, or I should say between this and the Only Watch, is that this features a oscillating pinion, and you can see that adjacent to the chronograph structure, the retropont structure at center, there is a very small oscillating pinion that engages and disengages the chrono, and this makes for a much smaller jump to the seconds hand when you start the watch. So you'll note, I, I start, I stop, I reset, but when I start, it's relatively smooth the way a vertical clutch would be, and that's the advantage of the oscillating pinion system over a traditional lateral clutch. You get the big, open, beautiful case back of a lateral clutch, but you don't get the jump and the stagger when you start of a lateral clutch, and this is a system that F.P. Jorn first pioneered in the Mono Pusher chronograph caliber he created during the 90s for Cartier. It's seen in watches like the Cartier Tour 2 Mono Pusher. The rest of the movement, 80 hour power reserve, manual wind, 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates. And as you can see, the steel components of the chronograph have been handsomely beveled on their side. You can see them starting to glow as I turn the, the watch relative to the camera. And then they've been satinated on their top. So beveling and satination with circular coat de Genève, black polished screws, and the beveling on Jorn bridges is getting better with time. It's beginning to look more mirrored and less machined. It's also a big, open, and beautiful movement, so you can see all of that for which you've paid. Let's throw this one on the wrist and get a sense of how it fits. I mentioned it's flat, but it's broad. At 44 millimeters, all in platinum, this is a heavy watch, but the bracelet nicely counterweight it. And once again, I really can't overstate two facts. This is the best version of this watch, and the rubber bumpers preserve the finish. They also provide a nice tonal contrast. So for me, this is exactly how I would want mine. Omega. Someone has to offer a value proposition, and today it's going to be the brand from BN. This is the Omega Speedmaster Orbis, a 2017 special edition designed for Orbis International as a charity benefit piece. Orbis is best known for its roving, world-wandering eye doctors who make a specialty of treating children and 
one of the keepsakes often left with the children they treat, teddy bears. So you have a teddy bear skeletonized counterweight to the second sand. You have Orbis blue on the dial. You have the Speedmaster signature in blue. There's a lovely anodized blue inboard chapter ring that represents the tachymeter insert. And you can see how there's a notch outboard of every numeral on the tachymeter. And this notched appearance, or I suppose we should say cut appearance, we'll call it the guichet tachymeter, it's rather reminiscent of Rolex's engine turned bezels. Now when you turn it over you see there is an Orbis teddy bear on the case back and the Orbis teddy bear is polished and it sits on a sort of matte honeycomb base that looks good. The Orbis logo displaces the hippocampus which is moved to the clasp and then inside the case of this 38 millimeter watch you have the 3330 which is basically a Valshu 7753 that's been given a power reserve upgrade, a free sprung regulator, a silicon hairspring, a chronometer certification, a column wheel actuation and in every regard it has been re-engineered to become Omega's own caliber. 52 hours of power reserve, a free sprung regulator, a chronometer certification. It has all of the refinements right down to the silicon anti-magnetic hairspring running for 52 hours and glowing brightly in the dark. This is an all-arounder that's also 100 meters water resistant, so 50 meters more than a moon watch and thus much more swimmable than a moon watch. A wrist down to 13 centimeters circumference will wear it well because it's less than 45 millimeters from lug to lug. So you can see overhead just how much clearance I've got on both sides of my wrist. This is a real cool piece, a memorable special series for a good cause and objectively good looking from the guichet tachymeter to the blue of the sub-registers which are ovalized to the counterweight of the seconds hand, the memorable case back and the hot rotted 7753 inside. This is a fantastic watch. But if you have more money to spend on your integrated bracelet sports watch, we throw the clock back to 2018 and the arrival of a watch that frankly I expected we'd see sooner. A Nautilus perpetual calendar, the 5740G, still 40 millimeters and remarkably slender. You can see it is wafer-like in profile. It has the warmth of white gold and you can really see the difference between the warmth of that white gold and the pure white of platinum, especially the polished portion. You can see it when they're side by side. Now the other thing that's important to note here is that the dial is not the standard blue of the 5711. First, it's not a gradient. It's consistent from side to side and end to end. It's all of one color. Second, it is a brighter, almost iridescent blue. It has a distinct metallic tone, so it seems to reflect a lot of light. There is a perpetual calendar system. The perpetual calendar is driven by a caliber 240 micro rotor, just like you'll find in a 5712, so the watch manages to remain thin in spite of its complications. Free sprung, silicon hairspring, micro rotor automatic, 48 hour power reserve, screw down crown and 60 meters water resistance, so the watch is actually okay for surface swimming. Throw it on the wrist, you can see just how flat and flush it is and how well it wears. It's probably my favorite current version of the Nautilus, rivaled only by the 5990, just because that one has so much going for it as a sports watch and a versatile complication. But the everyday complication is the perpetual calendar. You can use it for dating emails, memos, correspondence. And the timepiece is absolutely distinct, as it retains the thin profile of the Nautilus and the broad profile of the Nautilus. The 5990 is a little bit more of a mutation with a thicker case and a chunkier aesthetic. This feels a lot more like the 1976 Gerald Genta original. So if you're shooting for a 5990 or a 5740G, I really can't help you. I love them both, but objectively, there are fewer of these in the world. So if you want exclusivity and something with long-term prospects, this is the way to go. The timepiece is heavy, the bracelet is beautifully made, and one feature that I consider an upgrade versus other models is the use of a twin trigger deployant clasp on this watch. You can see internally the flourishes of the Calatrava cross, the high polish, the quality and substance of this component. This is the best clasp ever featured on any Nautilus watch. Oh my, Glasuta Original, I love you guys. But you only have one true design icon, and this is it. This is the 2014 Panamatic Inverse, the automatic winding version of the watch that originally launched at Basel World 2008. All the actions on the dial side with this Caliber 91, whereby you have a duplex black polished swan's neck regulator, 
a full balance bridge, each side freehand engraved, and then the German three-quarter style bridge is on the dial side. It really is an inverse movement. Now you can see it winds itself on the reverse side, but there's not much to see back there. 42-hour power reserve and the action is on the front. We have applique registers for the seconds as well as the minutes and the hours, and then we have the panorama datum with true flush fit date and a quick set system. The timepiece is slightly loomed, so you can't actually read it at night, and you can see that all of the fine finishing you would expect is on the dial side. There's beveling on the edge of the bridges, black polish on the swan's neck, fired blued screws, engine turning on the base plate, and glossuta stripes on the dial itself. You can even see the violet of the pivot jewels, meaning there's a beautiful array, gold, silver, violet, and blue on this dial. It's a large watch, but not an overpowering watch, at about 48 millimeters lug to lug. It's fairly flat and fairly short across the wrist, and you can really see that to good advantage from these different angles. It'll fit underneath most cuffs, maybe not the tightest of dress sleeves, but many jackets and many shirts. You can also see that there's plenty of clearance on each side of my wrist. So even if your wrist is 14 centimeters in circumference, I recommend you give this one a try. Again, Glasuta Original is often looked at as a longa knockoff, but with this watch, they caught fire in a bottle, lightning in a bottle, whatever you want to say, inspiration, and something truly original for which there is no longer equivalent. This is the face of the Geo manufacturer, and they truly are a manufacturer. They are making all parts of the watch. A great way to get into German watchmaking with an iconic model to boot. All right. We're turning back the clock here with FP Journe. We saw the sports watches, let's talk about a dress watch. This is the Octa Reserve de Marche, 38 millimeters in platinum, rose gold dial, very simple here. It's the double digit date, it's the power reserve, it's simple, a discontinued model in a discontinued size with a discontinued brass movement. This is the first version of the Octa Caliber 1300 bi-directional winding in this original iteration. It features brass bridges and plates, so it's brass rhodium plated to create the silvery sheen you see here. Five, well, 120 hour rated power reserve. Reality is that it'll run for about 160 at exhaustion, so it's closer to seven days of actual power reserve. The timepiece is one of the first 12 made. I can't show you the serial number, but I can tell you it's among the first dozen. You can also see that it's a French-made Eleanor case because the maker's mark of Eleanor as well as the French hallmarks are on there. And that's because prior to 2008, Journ cases were made by Eleanor of the Paris metropolitan area, his original case supplier back to his pocket watch days. So discontinued size, model, brass movement, and yes, case manufacture. This is a fantastic way to get into what we call vintage FP Journ, collectible FP Journ, with a timepiece that is really core to the collection. It's not one of those out there what-if watches, a peripheral model, or something that represents discontinuity with his philosophy. This is very central to F.P. Journe's journey as a watchmaker, as it was his first automatic winding model. The timepiece is flat, flush, and less than 45 millimeters from lug to lug, so it'll wear on any wrist. And with that matte finish rose gold dial and the black polished steel bezel, for the time, it is truly spectacular with an economy of details. You also note that wonderful frosted surface across the dial, as well as the black polished dial side bolts that Jorn first pioneered in the 90s. Lambasted first, this styling cue, bolts on the dial side, was ultimately universally copied with many others copying the look over time. F.P. Jorn, not just about engineering, but also design, he's been a leader on that front as well. Now, Turning back the clock even farther than the early 2000s, Patek Philippe in 2017 decided to reference a couple of its past models, and this is the 5320G Perpetual Calendar. It is 40 millimeters in diameter, but that is just about the only modern thing about it, as the triple-tiered lugs recall the vintage reference 2405 from the 1940s. And while the watch is often cited as a modern interpretation of the 1526 of 1942, their original perpetual calendar series production wristwatch, the reality is that it is the piece unique 1591 of 1944 that really informs this dial with the syringe style hands, the Arabic numerals, the aperture style perpetual calendar with the moon phase down at six o'clock. Finally, Patek is not referencing anything in particular 
when it created this lovely ecru or off-white almost eggnog lacquer dial. This is just beautiful and it's one of the watch's primary style innovations. The syringe hands are gorgeous and all of the white gold indices and numerals are blackened so that they contrast handsomely and dramatically against the dial base. Now the watch is a rare center rotor automatic for a Patek Perpetual calendar but it remains thin in profile and easy to wear with a lot of character on the wrist. We put it on a lovely new buck strap with that velvety texture to the alligator leather and you can see that it's a nice contrast with the soft tones of the dial. It's a little bit harder, a little bit darker, more intense. You can also see just how dramatically contoured this case is. This is probably the best Patek Fleet Perpetual Calendar release of the 2010s and one I remember well as everyone has an opinion on this watch and the detailing is superb. Not only does it have a vintage case and dial, but you can see that the crystal itself has been crafted in an extraordinarily tall cambered box section so that off axis it looks like the bubble of a vintage plexiglass. This is an awesome achievement by Patek, one of its modern day bests and in my opinion a future classic. Okay, we don't talk much about Jerome de Witt on this show, but we really should. He's been a master watchmaking force for a long time. He was one of the original independents. And along with his wife, he is still in the game, running the company that bears his name and building fascinating complications. This is the Tourbillon Force Constant. It was a limited edition of 25 pieces made back in 2006. It is a platinum watch, 43 millimeters in diameter, that had an original retail price of $260,000. He was a little bit late to the party with the Constant Force Tourbillon. Longa got there first and then F. Pijorn, but here's the deal. If you're going to be late, come with a new party favor. It, he uses a helical spring and a three-gear system to effectively create a remontoire de galette Constant Force device that's discharging into the escapement every 10 seconds. So the mainspring barrel, and the watch has a single mainspring barrel, that has a 72-hour power reserve, but as long as the system is running, the balance amplitude will remain constant. So just like the Pour Le Marie Tourbillon from Langa in 1994, just like the Tourbillon Remontoire from Jorn in 1999, this is a solution to the problem of maintaining constant force and constant amplitude in a Tourbillon regulator. So secondary factors such as multi-position adjustment can allow the Tourbillon to achieve its goal of precision. Recapping the original Abraham Louis Breguet gravitational minimization purpose of the tourbillon. So the timepiece is 43 millimeters with a remarkable case, a little bit like a Napoleonic colonnade, and this is probably the corniest part of the David story, but he often claims to be related to just about every royal who's ever existed, most notably the line of Napoleon Bonaparte. That doesn't matter. What does matter is that we have a watch that cost over a quarter million dollars, is entirely handmade, features a novel constant force device in tandem with the tourbillon, and a remarkable proprietary aerodynamic balance structure. The three-day power reserve is impressive, but so is the finishing, as this one is technically and artistically worthwhile, with six position adjustment giving deviation and accuracy no position in which to hide. Very few companies adjust to six positions, as even the chronometer standard only requires five positions of timing. It is a large watch, but by no means an overwhelmingly large watch, and on my wrist, which you know well is 16 centimeters in circumference. The timepiece has a lot of presence, but again, it fits. It's short across the wrist. The lugs are really stubby. So though it's all in platinum and packs a punch visually, I could wear this on a wrist as small as about 13 and a half to 14 centimeters circumference. And yes, it comes with a matching deployant clasp. A very special opportunity to own a watch from a rarely recognized pioneer in independent watchmaking. This is the De Witt Tourbillon Force Constant. Now, let's finish with something so rare, I've never seen one, and you'll never see another. Made in five pieces from 1998 to 2000, this 2001 retailed Audemars Piguet Jules Audemars Tourbillon Repetition Minute is the reference 25937. 40 millimeters in white gold, we are talking about a five-piece series. A minute repeater with a tourbillon, extraordinary hand finishing, and diamond-paved everything. The watch somehow pulls it off. 
First of all, there's a grandeur about this watch that has nothing to do with its color or its size. The white gold is cool, austere, appropriate, and nicely matched to the white gems. They're crystal clear, matched for color, character, as well as clarity. And the lugs, the bezel, and even the dial have been set manually, meaning not only is this a hand-finished watch, but it is an excruciatingly hand-crafted watch in a way most Audemars Marpigate timepieces today are not. The movement features a minute repeater, a tourbillon with a one-minute period, free-sprung, overcoil hairspring, 48-hour power reserve, and one of the loudest, and I, I might even go so far as to say briskest, or most brisk, recitations of the time. It is downright fleet in its relation of the time. So unlike, for example, the IWC minute repeater, which seems to chime for an hour, this one gets to the point rather swiftly. Do my best to get to 59 there. As you can see, the tourbillon is visible from both sides, and the watch, as you'll note, has been freehand engraved. Everything you see on the reverse side was done with a burin. This is not laser etched or machined. This is a truly handmade Audemars Piguet of extraordinary rarity and character. Truly rich, the epitome of high horology, and a monster complication. Any wrist can wear this. And, well, gems on men's watches can be controversial. There's absolutely no way to dispute that this watch is spectacular. Whether it's to your taste or not, it is memorable in a way that few watches I have ever shared will be memorable to me. And I've shot over 7,000 watches. This one has burned its shape into my memory. Guys, reach out to Team also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Let's do one more full strike. Because why not?